I am the uh, sales manager for long-term care, disability income, and critical illness. I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your, your busy Friday uh, to join us this morning. With me today is Brian Orr. Brian is our regional sales manager with Mutual of Omaha. And today, Brian will be talking to us about Mutual of Omaha's new cancer, heart attack, and stroke product, uh, who your market is, and why you should be selling it. And with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, to Brian. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Tim, and, th and thank you, everyone, for uh, jumping in on this Friday. Um, we are going to talk about uh, Mutual of Omaha's cancer, heart attack, stroke product, as well as the critical illness product. Uh, but more importantly than pure products is we want to talk about um, some key key points today, uh, such as how, do we, how does critical illness, how does the concept fit into your core business and your existing book of business? So we want to talk briefly about critical illness history and its marketplace. Really take a look at the target market that exists in the U.S. today. Um, and then talk about its advantages and capabilities so that no matter what style of sales of product that you do today, we want to show how critical illness can really help as far as being a, a quality complement to what you typically do out there in the marketplace today. Obviously, we're going to have a summary of questions at the end. I would like this to be interactive as much as possible. Uh, as I go through this, um, make sure you have your questions lined up so that when we get to the question section, uh, we can make sure that, that uh, we can show that um, you're getting exactly what you need out of this presentation. So again, very quickly here, talking a little bit about critical illness. How did this, how did this even really come about? Well, you know, it started out in South Africa. Now, you'll notice the, the, the year here, 1985. Uh, Dr. Marius Barnard in, in 1985, uh, what he had discovered is that a lot of people that he was treating uh, for serious situations, cancer, uh, heart attack, stroke, renal failure, uh, what was happening was that they, they were not able to get uh, fully recovered or start a good path on, into recovery uh, after certain situations because what had, what had occurred was a serious um, financial hole, black hole within, within the, a household uh, when these situations came up. So uh, Dr. Barnard actually went to uh, many carriers in South Africa and said, uh, is there a way to get some sort of protection plan in place? Because I personally am seeing this in a microcosm. I'm seeing this on a regular basis as far as uh, people losing their homes, uh, you know, splitting up, people not able to cope with these financial styles of disaster uh, after these different conditions. So 1985, relatively young product, uh, it started uh, and came out as a way to protect against financial potential ruin. Um, and, it, and it was probably one of the best structured uh, policies or protection plans that are out there today. Um, quickly, there was an expansion through the uh, late 80s and 90s uh, through the UK, Japan, Canada, Australia, uh, who found the same type. They empathized with that same style of pro income protection uh, need. And so, you know, the, the UK especially, I mean, they, they started uh, in the late 80s, had around 100,000 critical illness policies. Uh, and then got into around 1991, and that jumped up to 700,000 critical illness policies written in that year. And they continue to have a meteoric rise uh, in these countries as far as, uh, it's probably the number two um, protection plan that's written in, in these countries. So the question becomes, well, you know, in the United States, why has this not really kind of taken off as it has uh, in these other countries? Well, a couple, couple of things. Number one, uh, it, it only came about in 1985. That's, that's uh, like I said, uh, of all the products that exist out there, uh, it's a very recent uh, protection style. 
and uh, also there's we, we want to look at you know in the United States we we seem to have uh, in comparison to these other other countries we have um, two things that sort of work against the growth of critical illness in this country. The one is that we have a lot of industry experts on the individual level that feel that uh, critical illness is not um, a good comprehensive solution that may exist more than, you know, it may exist in a better form out there in other types of policies. Uh, we are a litigious type of country and we always want to look at and say, are, are we offering the right protection plan for our clients in as far as uh, if something were to blow up in my face, um, what 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 would happen uh, in that situation? And uh, what we want to talk about today is certainly overcome that objection because uh, that obstacle in itself uh, means that all we're showing people is critical illness. What, what we want to talk about is how critical illness is the perfect product to complement any other income protection plan that you may have that would have gaps as as is uh, with just that product. There would be gaps in protection in the case of a critical illness happening to an individual. So, um, and, and, and as we see in the third bullet point here, um, it's not as popular in the US, yet we have seen double digit growth from 2013 to now as far as policies, simply because the training has expanded for critical illness outside of the group style of critical illness offering. Uh, much of the the offering that happened in the United States since the beginning, since 1985, um, has been focused around carriers that have offered it as a group coverage in a worksite style uh, offering, and because of that, most of the training has been focused around uh, individual uh, or, or or focused around group salespeople that were benefit experts. So you know because of that. Uh, we're seeing, we're seeing, we're now seeing growth because of training like this one um, uh, that we can get out to more independent producers, people who sell independent individual policies. So, you know, critical illness. How is this uh, structured, and what's so uh, quote unquote amazing about this product? Well, it's one of the few products that uh, pays a lump sum benefit after di after a certain diagnosis. So. When we talk about indemnity plans, um, you know, we look at this type of product to say, what other type of product is a lump sum payment after a trigger? Well, life insurance, correct? Uh, lump sum payout typically after a trigger of death. Well, in this situation, it's one of the few products where we say, that take that simple concept and apply it to a situation where there's not death involved but there is a need for a protection of, of property, a protection of income during life when these types of uh, occurrences happen. Um, a, a very, very uh, seldom do we see a product that can pay uh, a, a lump sum that one can do whatever they want to with uh, after a particular trigger. And in this situation, we have it with a diagnosis of a, of a certain covered illness. We'll talk about what those illnesses are in a second. Um, sold individually, uh, it's also sold via worksite um, as individual or as group. So those those uh, versions of this product do exist. Um, uh, it can be fully underwritten. Uh, there's typically a, a, what people like to sell is a simplified issue. Uh, and I will be talking about Mutual of Omaha specifically when we get into what are, where are the um, different areas that, that one can write a simplified issue for either critical illness or a specialized program. Um, and right now in the U.S., a majority of the policyholders are around ages 35 to 44 with an income between 25000 and 74000 Now, I know that's going to sound kind of interesting, probably maybe... Um, not as intuitive as you might think as far as hitting in the marketplace. Um, most people think it's going to be a much older population that takes this type of plan and someone who might have uh, more income to lose, so to speak. But when we talk about what this uh, marketplace means, when we say the majority of policyholders at age 35 to 44 with an income of 25 to 74,000, two things pop up. Obviously, we're talking about a, a 
high amount of sales within a work site type of plan, and that is simply because of where the training for this product has been up to this date. Um, I think we're going to see these ages go up more or be more robust, and I think we're going to see incomes go higher as we start to sell more of an individual product out there, uh, non-work site, with financial advisors, with people that are talking to folks about retirement, long-term care, et cetera. What conditions are typically covered when we say that there's a trigger that would start this lump sum payment? What are the conditions that are typically covered under that? Well, when we talk about the Mutual of Omaha plan, and, and pretty much almost every uh, critical, true critical illness plan that's out there, um, let me show you the big ones here. Um, right here are the bullet points where uh, a majority of plans are going to have these conditions covered under critical illness. So if someone were to get diagnosed with cancer, and we want to talk about what stage uh, that would mean and what that would be. When we talk about cancer, heart attack, stroke, those are over 90% of claims in this marketplace. So huge amount of claims are with these three conditions. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because many carriers have, in the United States especially, have moved away from the full critical illness plan to specialize in these three key uh, conditions, and Mutual of Omaha is one of them. We have a, a separate cancer, heart attack, stroke policy. Um, why is that? Well, number one is most folks know that this is where a majority of claims happen, um, and that this is where the consumers, when you look at the consumers, this is where the consumers are most concerned about protecting for their family and against their property. Uh, loss of property is, uh, you know, you see family histories of cancer, family histories of hypertension that could lead to heart attack, stroke. Um, you know, end-stage renal failure, again, when we look at, at that type of uh, condition, again, we see a family history typically that we want to protect against. These are the stories that typically happen when we talk about critical illness uh, affecting someone's income, someone's household, someone's property, et cetera. Uh, these are the financial disasters that are on the consumer's mind. So um, outside of that, you're going to see those second tier type of coverages happening that are still covered under a, a, a full critical illness policy, such as major organ transplant, uh, Alzheimer's, blindness, deafness, paralysis. Um, these are going to be situations where, again, these types of diagnoses are going to come up and it's going to trigger a payout of the policy. Now, the unique structure of this policy is that <clears throat> there, are, there are different carriers out in this marketplace and there are different ways that these things pay out once you see these conditions. So in some cases, you may just see a simple policy, a critical illness policy, where if you were to get any one of these conditions that I just talked about, uh, if you were to get a diagnosis of any one of these, you would get paid out whatever your face value of the policy is, and then the policy is over. Um, there are some policies that exist out there that they either, number one, have different sections of conditions, so uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, and they either pay out where they say, uh, if you were to hit a Tier 1 condition, you'd get 100% of your uh, face value. Or if you were to get uh, a Tier 1 or Tier 2, it may pay out either 100% again, or it may pay out 75%, 50%, 25% of the face value. Um, these exist out there, and again, financial brokerage uh, do not hesitate to use the resources that you have at your fingertips uh, with the partner that you work with here as far as um, what carriers have what type of plans out there because there are different types that exist out there uh, and there are ways to uh, look at what is the best option for your client. Um, when we talk about specialized products, once again, uh, Mutual of Omaha using an example of a separate cancer plan or a heart attack stroke plan or the combination of a cancer heart attack, stroke plan, there you have the situation of if someone were to get diagnosed with cancer, um, uh, they would get paid on the plan, and then the plan would still be active, 
in case there was a situation where that person, insured person, was then to get diagnosed uh, with a heart attack or stroke. Um, so that policy would continue to go forward in that in that sense. I want to talk about two key conditions when we say those big three, you know, cancer, heart attack, stroke. I want to make sure that those out there that this may not be your core product, um, you know, we talk about what is cancer in situ. This could happen, this could vary between policies and, and what type of uh, uh, when we talk about out there. So when you're talking with clients and they say, well, what would happen in a situation where I would have cancer in situ? Uh, that means cancer in situation, and that simply means it's a stage of cancer, typically an early stage of cancer, stage one or earlier, where you have a diagnosis of the disease, and it's in a site from which it started and is not spread to the surrounding tissue or organs. Um, in some situations, cancer in situ may be malignant, it may not. Um, when you look at carriers and how they cover uh, this type of situation, uh, they may cite specifically on their policy. Uh, cancer in situ would be considered a, you know, uh, we would pay out a benefit in a situation where the, the cells are definitely malignant, uh, but if it's cancer in situ where it's in, these, in the area that it was found, and it has not spread or metastasized to surrounding tissues or organs, we would still pay a benefit, but in some cases that may be a lower percentage of the total benefit. The reason for that is that cancer in situ is typically something that a simple operation or, you know, a simple operation can remove that uh, stage, that, that type of cancer, um, uh, relatively easy without long needs of missing work or, or losing one's income. So you would still get a, a payment uh, in your policy, but in that situation it may be a lower percentage of payment uh, on a cancer in situ. Uh, angioplasty is another one that since the creation of the product uh, has been a technological advance uh, when we talk about heart attack stroke. Uh, angioplasty, obviously, as everyone knows, is um, just simply a, a repair or unblocking of a blood vessel, um, most typically a coronary artery when we talk about putting this in place and having this process of ballooning, so to speak. Those of you that have heard of, oh yeah, I, I have an uncle or I have a father or grandfather that's going in to get their, get their artery ballooned. Um, you know, that's the angioplasty. It's a procedure that's typically used. Uh, they try to do it in lieu of having to do a full bypass surgery. Again, the, the advancement on this process um, is typically um, a lower percentage of total benefit because the advancement of the, the procedure um, really doesn't knock folks out for a long period of time, if at all, uh, after an angioplasty. So uh, depending on the carrier you would use, um, de depending on the product that you would be looking for, that would trigger an event, however, would it be the full benefit? In a lot of cases, the answer is no on angioplasty. Matter of fact, a majority of cases, it's no. Usually the benefit there would be around 10%, 25%, things like that. And the reason why I'm not giving specifics out there is because I want you to make sure that you're understanding the concept of critical illness and where it fits in the marketplace, that you are aware of these terms, aware of what might be a lower percentage, and that you're using your partners, your experts here at Financial Brokerage, that they can, they can help you in what carrier may fit best in the situation that you may have with your clients. So when we talk about Mutual of Omaha specific, we have a true critical illness plan um, that would cover multiple uh, conditions, the condition, conditions I care, uh, covered earlier. Um, there is a critical illness true plan that is a, you can do simplified issue, which means simply a application and an interview, up to $99,000 of coverable uh, benefit. Um, it has the multiple condition coverage. The eligible ages for that product is ages 20 to 64. Um, we also have what's more popular with us now is in the last year we've released a specialized cancer heart attack stroke standalone policy that you can either break out as a simple cancer uh, plan or a heart attack stroke plan or a combination of the three, knowing that these are the big um, uh, conditions that happen in, in, the, uh, in the industry. 
and those can be those are simplified issue up to fifty thousand. Now, in this case, what do I mean by simplified issue? Well, the application, uh, if you were to get all three coverages, the health questions on the application, there's only eight uh, total. Um, so that it's a very simplified process when you break out these conditions. It's also very uh, nice because it also brings the cost of coverage down. So when you have someone that buys into this concept, but they say, uh, I just want to have coverage for cancer or heart attack stroke because cancer runs in my family or hypertension runs in my family, then this is a way to bring the cost down and have a good simplified issue cash payout of up to 50000 um, after a diagnosis for that situation. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, each separate policy, a cancer product, can have a rider for both a heart attack stroke um, and a heart attack stroke can have a rider that would cover cancer. The other advantage of this when you break out these types of products is your eligible age is really spread out. So now we're looking at ages 18 to 99 uh, as far as eligible coverage. Um, most common products we're seeing sold right now is probably around the $30,000 range uh, on a cancer heart attack stroke product and usually it's for all three conditions and um, the costs are extremely low. Uh, so, and as we'll talk about later on, and how do we sell this thing uh, if my main product or core product is X, um, we'll find that this, because the product cost is so low, it is usually not really an objection to overcome when we're having the uh, holistic uh, con uh, conversation about protecting either our property or our income. So let's step back for a second and, and talk about this middle market. Uh, that we mentioned, um, you know, middle market to me, and again, we look at where these policies are being sold currently with the ages that we're seeing, uh, around 35, 44, highest salary around 75,000. I'd like to talk a little bit about a very interesting uh, LIMRA study that, that took place in, in this, what's called this middle market, where we looked at... Uh, LIMRA looked at uh, salaries between 35000 and 99000 and between the ages of 25 to 64. This is certainly the sweet spot when we talk about uh, critical illness or these breakout type of products. This in the U.S., we're talking about 40 million households in this U.S., uh, according to this study through LIMRA. And one of the most important things out there is that these folks uh, are, that are really looking for this style of product has uh, a real challenge with savings. They're carrying debt. Uh, over 70% uh, of the people in, in this uh, study are carrying more than $10,000 of non-mortgage debt. And when you look at this salary of $35,000 and $99,000, 10, 15, 25,000 uh, in non-mortgage debt is really something that could be a financial disaster should, should the uh, unknown happen. Um, and we look at how they are not prepared at all for a disability or critical illness. We're going to look, about that, look at that a little more in depth. Um, most importantly, though, their responses were they have such a strong value in their trusted advisor. But if we think about it, ages 30, um, uh, the salaries between 35000 and 99000 who are those folks' trusted advisor? Who are they talking about? Well, I can tell you right now who they're probably talking about is their state farm rep or their all-state advisor. Um, because in that salary range, very rarely are you seeing the qualified uh, health or life-focused uh, people in the industry talking to people in this, in this salary range. It is typically going to be their P&C agent or it's going to be uh, their, uh, a, yeah, their agent that, that protects their home, protects their car, uh, things like that. Um, just an example, last year State Farm wrote 15,000 disability income policies. Uh, 15,000 in one year. That is more than MetLife, who is, a, who is a key writer of disability in the, in the, in the industry. Uh, that's more than Emeritus and Standard combined. 
Um, they wrote 15,000 policies, disability policies. They are not a disability income company. Um, why are they doing this? Because it's showing that people in this marketplace are becoming more and more vocal about how do I protect my income in the case of a potential disaster? How can I protect my house that we are now doing our, our uh, you know, we did, just did a policy in case lightning strikes a tree that falls into my house, but what happens if lightning strikes me? What happens to my, my home then? I can't work. Um, they have a major value in a trusted advisor. Um, and they want to see a trusted carrier. You know, they, they know the carriers that exist in certain marketplaces. They're going to typically go with a carrier that they know and trust out there uh, as, strong as, as far as strong um, financial strength. So very interesting as far as this study that occurred out there. Um, I love these types of slides when we talk about uh, if there's a need for, they need help from an advisor to help them with their savings help them with the income that they have in here. So if we look at this slide, um, as, as, as far as of the 40 million households, um, how are we doing as far as salary breakouts um, in, in being able to save on a regular basis in the case of an emergency? We could look at ages 25 to 64. Keep in mind, what is the age range for critical illness? Almost exactly that. Um, we look at who are managing normally uh, uh, and, and, and doing well as far as uh, saving on a regular basis. Not a lot of people. If I look at that uh, range of 35,000 to 74.9 thousand, those two middle bars, 5% uh, and 6% respectively, very challenging to look at. Um, a lot of folks consider doing fine, saving a little regularly, um, keeping in mind that they're, they're managing this debt, uh, they need folks to come in and talk to them about, you know, how am I managing my money and how am I protecting my income and protecting my assets in the case of any kind of financial emergency. Um, over 70% of the people surveyed and, or, of, this, of these folks that we're talking about, over 70% that if there were a $5,000 financial emergency, let's say they have a $5,000 a deductible on their major medical, and they had a uh, they had a they had a, a medical situation where they had to pay that first five thousand dollars out of pocket. Over seventy percent of people that were in this study stated that they would have to borrow money to cover that cost. That's there's something inherently wrong with that. When these types of products exist out there, especially when you can get it as low as a lump sum benefit of ten thousand dollars on a triggering event should something happen or occur. Um, and we're going to talk about more that more in depth in a, in a second. And if we look again at um, another, uh, what I think is the most important uh, slide, we look at uh, death, disability, or critical illness going from left to right. Um, who's prepared in this marketplace for something like that? Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, scientist to know that if I have problems saving, and I am carrying debt, that if something were to occur in my life, like a death, a disability, or a critical illness, I am not going to be prepared. Well, the statistics are, are horrifying. Um, if we look at, especially look at critical illness, I mean, 66% would have either a significant or a drastic financial change in their household. Uh, that is screaming for ideas in how can I protect this in an inexpensive or optimal way in my household. 40 million potential customers out there. Why are we not going after this marketplace? Why are we not looking at this marketplace? Uh, why are we not looking at it as a value opportunity of, for volume? Um, and if we go into it, we say, okay, that critical illness slide, how would that affect one's income? You know, um, uh, if we say, okay, I, I, I'm protecting a cancer, um, I'm totally fine with having this fall under my major medical. Well, according to the American Cancer Society, two-thirds of cancer costs are non-medical. Two-thirds of cancer costs of this financial emergency are non-medical um, because of 
experimental treatments that exist that are not covered under major medical. Uh, home renovations that are typically needed uh, should a certain diagnosis of certain cancers happen uh, that would affect your body overall. And then obviously, private nurse costs. Those of you that sell long-term care, uh, what are, that's pretty cheap, right? No, it is not. Two-thirds of cancer costs are, are non-medical, this financial emergency that may happen out there. And in a lot of cases, people need child care while this is going on and it's being treated because there's no way that someone staying at home uh, going through this process is going to be able to, to, to care for anyone, uh, let alone themselves. And if we talk about a kidney transplant, one of those coverable situations in critical illness affecting income, um, most people say, well, the transplant itself, <clears throat> you know, uh, critical illness is a nice uh, complement to my major medical. Well, beyond that, most of the costs, the high costs that happen with a kidney transplant are due to high pharmacy uh, need that is needed for life after a kidney transplant. And almost across the board, these types of prescriptions are not covered or have a definite cap on benefit on major medical. Again, room accommodation during the procedure for those that are family members that are there during the procedure, uh, after the procedure for those that are helping in care, um, critical illness is, is highly effective because, again, it's a lump sum payment, cash for you to use as you wish. And also, as we talked about before, private nurse and child care, uh, high costs that can be paid with, with cash. So if you are selling major medical plans out there, how can critical illness serve as a complement to a major medical? Well, we talked about that a little bit with uh, those high costs on the cancer side, uh, you know, along with that philosophy, obviously it assists with your deductible and copay gaps that exist in major medical. Again, these are cash. So when you look at a lot of medical plans that exist out there, those of you that are life insurance sales folks, that you say, okay, um, tell me a little bit about your major medical plans. How many times have someone told you that they have a $100 deductible, a $250 deductible? Uh, not in the last 10 years probably. What we're seeing now are $1,000 deductibles, $3,000 deductibles, $5,000 deductibles. Uh, large medical expenses coming out of pocket before anything pays under a plan. This can be complemented by cash, cash being paid at a triggered event that would easily burn through the first $1,000, $3,000, or $5,000 of a deductible, and it would help pay pharmacy co-pays um, for ongoing treatment. So a $10,000 plan would certainly help someone uh, in filling that gap and help pay for a ongoing co-pays uh, out of pocket for ongoing prescriptions that one would need for almost all of these conditions. Um, again, you're providing capital to someone. It's an indemnity plan. Here is cash. You are not bound to go to any hospital that your major medical is saying you must go to. If I'm giving you this lump sum of cash, you go to where you think you can get cured or you can go into remission. With cash, you are able to do that. Under the medical, uh, major medical um, plans, you are bound to where you're going to pay the most out of that plan. Um, this gives you choice and control. This plan is a great complement because it provides choice and control to whatever their major medical is. Um, it also fills in gaps where major medical reimbursements are very weak or non-existent. Most of that's going to be under physical therapy, uh, th things under that uh, type of umbrella. So if you're out there selling DI, disability income uh, plans to folks, uh, a lot of times people feel that this is going to cannibalize my DI sale. Um, you know, I can't sell this product because I'm trying to sell DI and it covers the same stuff. Well, again, if we look at this product, it can be very, very cheap as an add-on. And a lot of disability policies have a critical illness rider. Um, I know Mutual of Omaha does. Their disability income policy has a critical illness rider that you can put on there to help fill the gaps when we talk about what an elimination or waiting period is under the disability income policy. Um, I do this presentation a lot in person, so I usually say to folks, 
what's the most common elimination period under any dis long-term disability plan on, for an individual? It's usually 90 days. Let's think about this marketplace again. Let's think about any marketplace. I know we like to think, well, you can simply get savings in place and self-fund for 90 days. Have you ever tried it? Have you ever put it out on paper how much you make and how much you would have to pay out of your savings to recover from a 90-day income loss? It can be challenging for a lot of people. There are a lot of people at a lot of high salaries that I've seen in my career that are living pretty close to one to two paychecks away from some financial problems, even at those levels. Because people simply live at the level that they're earning. So we fill in the gap on elim elimination period with what? What's the best thing that can do that? Cash. So in the case of an illness, a critical illness especially, cancer, heart attack, stroke, at the diagnosis, there's a cash given on the policy. That policy's over. You have cash to take you over the 90-day hump that then your disability plan kicks into. It's a very smart, simple type of plan for any client. And again, you can help in, in you can use it as a, a replacement, <clears throat> an income replacement plan for uninsurable incomes, bonuses that may not be covered under group plans, uh, commissions that may not be covered under group plans. And if you have an uninsurable health history, uh, you have a history, uh, a history of, of certain things that you can't get a DI plan, a lot of times you can get a critical illness or a cancer, heart attack, stroke plan. Um, and again, it could just covers additional costs that uh, uh, may be over and above the replacement of income. Keep in mind, disability income is to replace household income. It can never be 100% of replacement. So you're going to see maybe 60% of income replaced. Uh, these conditions bring in more costs to the household, not less. So you need that cash to help with that ongoing cost. If I sell life insurance, Basically, the smartest thing is if I have a term life insurance product with my client that does not have an accelerated benefit option, here is my separate accelerated benefit option that can cover and give cash, uh, partial payment at least, to someone uh, should they uh, develop a condition that would not result in death. Um, huge amount of sales in, the, in uh, Europe, in Japan, in Canada, are a mortgage protection plan to complement term life insurance. Um, you know, the term policies, a lot of times, they, they're used to protect against protect assets. I should die. I want to make sure my family has the house paid off. Well, here is your mortgage protection plan that gives you cash should you not die, and you get a lump sum payment um, until, in some cases, the inevitable occurs. Um, Standalone products, the cancer, heart attack, stroke products, one of the most important things about it is a lot of times they do not take family history into consideration. So I would ask this question of anyone on this call. If you have a client that has been, that has been diagnosed with cancer, uh, the next call you should make after we, we hang up is to that person to say, tell me about your 18 or 20-year-old or 25-year-old uh, and let's protect them against the same situation. Let's protect them against genetics in this situation. Let's get a plan in place to make sure that we have protection in play at a very optimal level, a very inexpensive level. If I sell long-term care, um, I, I want to talk about, you know, um, how do we complement long-term care? Uh, again, in long-term care, the diagnosis is a payout on critical illness, but what if you don't meet the definition on a long-term care. You don't have, uh, you're, you're, you're not unable to do two of the six activities of daily living. Um, we would rather have an a, a inexpensive thing in place that would pay on diagnosis, not dependent on the activities of daily living. Uh, it fill in some of the gaps. It would give additional indemnity over the top of some replacement or reimbursement long-term care plan. Uh, and again, like I said, it's simple additional indemnity. If, if you have a reimbursement long-term care plan that's not indemnity, then you have a combination of both, a reimbursement of costs, but also cash for groceries or things as you wish. 
So I'd like to take a, a brief, some brief time here to, to, to answer any questions, and then I'll wrap up. Any questions out there? No questions? Muted.